Welcome to Community Bible Baptist Church. Let's all stand. We're going to turn to page number 42 in the hymnal. Page number 42. Everybody standing will sing, Saved by the Blood of the Crucified One. Page number 42. Saved by the blood of the crucified one, now ransomed from sin and a new work begun. Sing praise to the Father and praise to the Son. Say by the blood of the crucified one. Say, saved. My sins are all pardoned. My guilt is all gone. Say, saved. I'm saved by the blood of the crucified one. Saved by the blood of the crucified one, the angels rejoicing because it is done. A child of the Father, join heir with the Son. Saved by the blood of the crucified one, saved, saved. My sins are all pardoned, my guilt is all gone. Saved, saved, I'm saved by the blood of the crucified one. Saved by the blood of the crucified one. The Father he spake, and his will it was done. Great price of my pardon, his own precious Son. Saved by the blood of the crucified one. Saved, saved. Sins are all pardoned. My guilt is all gone. Save, save. I'm saved by the blood of the crucified one. Saved by the blood of the crucified one. All hail to the Father, all hail to the Son. All hail to the Spirit, the great three in one. Saved by the blood of the crucified one. Saved, saved. My sins are all pardoned, my guilt is all gone. Saved, saved. I am saved by the blood of the crucified one. Amen. Amen. Well, we're glad to hear. Uh, we're glad to have you tonight. I uh, got some popping, so if I fall over with a heart attack, that'll be what happened. But uh, Tuesday night, a revival meeting, and we're excited that you're here. Good to have each of you. Got some special guest and a lot to do tonight. In the immortal words of the great theologian Jerry Reed. We have a short, a long way to go and a short time to get there. And so uh, let's uh, get right into the service. And I want you to meet some folks. If you're visiting tonight, your first time or first time in a long time, I want you to slip up your hand. Good to have the Reed family back here to the right. And uh, they're missionaries to Thailand. You'll meet him in just a moment. And not just missionaries to Thailand, but they're going at first to work with Shreshan Horn. And we're just excited about that. Of course, Greg and Robin are here. And they're, of course, no stranger to us. But we're glad they're in tonight. And each of you get busy tonight. We're glad that you're here and looking forward to a great night. Don't forget, tomorrow night, regular church, but there will be no bus stop and there'll be no master club. We'll all meet right in here and looking forward to the closing service. And so, and the teens will meet in here as well. So everybody in here tomorrow night, and we're going to meet in this room tomorrow night. We're going to get to use this room because there's no bus stop. So we're going to meet in this room. All right, any questions about that? All right, good, Josh. All right, all right, all right. All right, let's pray together and ask for to bless the service, and we're going to get right, right into uh, what the Lord has for us. Father, I pray your blessing now on all that uh, we're going to do tonight. And, Lord, we do want to be mindful of time, but the truth is we're in the last days of the end times. 
And so, Lord, we need to concentrate on that which is the most important. And that's your word. That's the cause of Christ. That's world missions. And so we're going to hear the preaching. And we're going to hear what you're doing, Lord, and the call to the Reed's life. And, Lord, we're going to look forward to every aspect of this service. And we're just going to put on pause a little bit all the hectic schedule that we have so that we might enjoy some time in the Word of God, in God's house, and with the people of God. I pray you bless Brother Henson. I pray you bless Brother Jones. And God, we just pray you'd use them tonight in a great, great way. We ask it now in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Now, now let me explain. I would not normally try to put too much in a service, but uh, we wanted Brother Chris Reed to come for our missions conference, but he could not come. And the truth is, they're going to try their best not to be here for next year's missions conference because they want to get on the field. And uh, this is a connection, not through just the horns, uh, who we support and love dearly, but uh, Chris's wife is a friend of mine. Uh, his fam her family, her father, and especially her uncles are friends of mine from long years ago. And I want Chris to come tonight, and we're not going to have a full missionary presentation. We're not doing slides and stories, but I want you to see his face and hear his story, and uh, then uh, you'll know as the Lord leads, Brother David has been in contact with him before, and it just worked out, they're going to be in a missions conference in Tampa, and I ask him, if you're going to be this close, come on over and at least meet the folks so that we'd not be strangers to you, so I want you to meet Chris Reed tonight. Good evening. I am excited to be able to be here with you and kind of share my burden for Thailand. Uh, my name is Chris Reed. I'll introduce my wife back there, Becca, and she has our daughter, Sayla. She's a year old, and we also have a son, Ethan, and he's two years old. It was a year ago, a little over a year ago, when my wife and I were in Thailand and walking through the streets of Thailand where God really burdened us for that country. When you're in a country of 70 million people with 94% Buddhist, Buddhist temple after Buddhist temple is on every corner. You have Buddhist monks walking down the street. You have people on their knees giving gifts to a Buddhist monk and, and giving some kind of chant and blessing. And you know they're just trying to find answers to life. They're trying to find something, and you know they're never going to find it in Buddhism. And when we were there, we saw that it was burned with our heart. We really began to pray that where God would have us, and he really burdened and called us to the country of Thailand. And we're excited about that. We are, we've been on deputation now for coming up on a year. Um, we're about 55% um, of our support raised. And we're planning on finishing up in November and leaving the first week of December. And uh, we, since we've surrendered to go, um, an opportunity opened up. And you're familiar with the Horns ministry there in, in Thailand. And um, we've been in touch with Sher Shan Horn. My wife knew the Horns. She actually went to their ministry when she was in high school a couple times over the summers. And I uh, was able to serve there. I never got to meet um, Brother Horn, but I've heard so much about him. And what God has done through their ministry in 25 years is truly amazing. And we, um, since he had passed away a couple years ago, um, Shershan is in, in really need of someone to come and help. And, uh, and be, being in touch with Pastor Norris, their sending church, we've, he's asked us to go there and to help. And so we're excited about that opportunity. If you know, they have 90 kids in the children's home. Um, they've started 16 churches up in the Hill Tribes. They have a church there of about 25, 30 members, and uh, they just need somebody there to preach, to teach, to disciple, um, to help really impact the next generation of people in Thailand through the kids, but also have the opportunity to reach into more hill tribe villages and start more churches and to see more, more, more souls saved. Because that's the goal, is to, uh, is to see churches planted, started, and uh, making a lasting impact in that country. I grew up in a, a Christian home. I saved at 17. I was a firefighter for, uh, for 10 years in Las Vegas. I thought that was my set. I had my dream job. I, I was set, but God had another plan. He, uh, he wanted to direct me to preach. He called me to preach, and now he's directing us to the mission field, and uh, we're excited about that, to be able to preach and disciple and to see souls saved in the country of Thailand. So I'm asking for you to pray for us because uh, we know it's only going to be through, through God's people praying. Um, our verse is Ephesians 3.20, and unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. And that's what we know. The only thing that's going to happen in Thailand long term is going to be God working. So we're asking for your prayers, and uh, we're praying that we can finish up quickly so we can get over there, learn the language, and begin serving in Thailand. So thank you, Pastor, for this opportunity for us to say something. And uh, I do have some prayer cards. If you'd like one, please come by and see me, and I'd love to give you a prayer card. Thank you. Amen. Let's stand together one more time. We're going to turn to page 57 in the hymnal and sing at Calvary. Page number 57, the first and the last verse. Everybody stand together. Here we go. Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me he died on Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free, 
pardon there was multiplied to me there my burden soul found liberty at calvary and the last verse oh the love that drew salvation's plan oh the grace that brought it down to man Oh, the mighty gulf that God did span at Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. You may be seated. I don't want you to get your Bible out. I learned a long time ago. I remember, in fact, I remember when I when I this lesson was taught to me, and it was by your first cousin, Harvey Ware. And uh, I was at a church up in uh, up when he pastored on the, the Hill Church there on uh, Murphy uh, on sixty or sixty four, I think, the River Road. And uh, I was a young preacher. I mean, just just in I was still in Bible college, and Brother Harvey at that time was probably up in his late sixties, I guess. I don't think he was in the seventies yet. But uh, he said, we have a young man going to preach for us tonight. And uh, it was one of the first opportunities I had to preach after being at Midwestern. And I remember that night him being gracious to me as a young preacher. And I said in my heart, as I get to be a, a preacher and get to pastor, I want to be gracious to uh, not just the younger men, but the older men. And I'm excited about the young men and their zeal. But I learned a long time ago, if you want wisdom, you go to the older men. And if you've been preaching 46 years... And you haven't killed anybody yet. Uh, you're a testimony example. So I, I would rather hear, I'll be honest with you, I'd rather hear Roger Henson preach than most men I know. Just because of faithfulness, just because of consistency, because he knows the one he talks about. And I just like his spirit. I like his stories. I want him to come preach for us tonight. Brother Roger, you come. God bless. Let's give him a big hand, please, tonight. Amen. <clears throat> It is good to be here. In my condition, it's good to be anywhere. Uh, well, the Lord has sure been good to the Hensons, and I appreciate your pastor and his wife and this ministry here. It's just wonderful. I'm going to read in <clears throat> in Second Timothy chapter four. You can be turning there. I heard about a fella going to Cracker Barrel. I like Cracker Barrel. Anybody else like Cracker Barrel? And uh, he went in to Cracker Barrel one morning, and he wasn't too big a fella, wasn't too large, and he ordered almost everything on the uh, breakfast menu. You know, half a dozen eggs, bacon, sausage, piece of ham, all the trimmings, I mean, it just covered the whole table. When the waitress brought his food, he was sitting by himself, and it just covered up that table. And a fellow sitting next to him said, uh, he said, hey, buddy, said, you know eating like that's going to kill you? He said, well, I don't know. He said, my granddaddy, he lived to be 98. That fellow said, eating like that? He said, no, minding his own business. <laughs> that same guy came back that afternoon to the same Cracker Barrel, and as he approached the door, a lady approached at the same time, and being the good Southern gentleman that he was, he held the door for her. She started through the door, and she was from New York City. When she started through the door, she looked around at him, and she said, I hope you're not holding this door because I'm a woman. Oh, no, he said, I'm not holding it because you're a woman. I'm holding it because of your age. <laughs> she said, I'll have you to know my age is my own business. He said, you're absolutely right, ma'am. Looks like you've been in that business a long time. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you better be prepared if you go to Cracker Barrel. No telling what you're going to run into. 2 Timothy 4, I want to read a few verses here in, 
and uh, try to give you what I think the Lord gave me. Right in verse number one, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust <clears throat> shall they have uh, shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. And Paul says in verse 6, For I am now ready to be offered. Time of my departure is at hand. Then he's talking of himself in verse 7. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me, for Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed <coughs> unto Thessalonica, Crescens unto Galatia, Titus unto Dalmatia, only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. Let me stop reading there. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, I do thank you tonight for this privilege and opportunity to stand here in this pulpit. I understand what it represents, and I pray Lord, that you'll be seen above all else. May Jesus be high and lifted up. May I not say a word in error. May you guard my lips and my mouth that I do no harm to your word. Make it possible now for us to worship, and we'll give you all the credit for it. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Paul's farewell letter. I think he's the greatest Christian of the church age. I think that's who we're reading after. If you count Hebrews, he wrote 14 books in the New Testament, and I do, and I thank God for this powerful little man. According to history, he was a diminutive man, not that large a person. You understand, you don't have to be big in your own self to do something for God. It's the bigness of God in us that makes the difference. If he's seen, all else is forgotten about, amen? And here Paul is really, he's given this discourse uh, to one of his sons in the faith. Even the book is named after him, Timothy. And he had a first Timothy in which he instructed. And now here, I like Paul, this is 30 years after the Damascus Road, and he's still plugged in to what God called him to do out there on that road. And he's reporting it. Uh, the charge that Paul is making is to one of these personal acquaintances, one of these sons in the faith, that he has taken along with him, and they have experienced the presence of God in the life of Paul, and they know that these reports are true and how they're spoken. Uh, I mean, there's, uh, there's the opportunity that they have seen that, some of these young men. He always seemed to have somebody with him. And, uh, you know, he is, isn't it something? I mean, it's just like God to take the great destroyer of the church attempting to destroy it altogether and make him the wise master builder. 
that he from the prison cell, maybe in eye shod of Nero's chop block, that he's going to die in in a little while. He, it's not recorded, his death isn't recorded in the scripture, but we know Bible history indicates that that's what happened. I'm glad to tell you tonight that it does not matter how long you serve or how little you serve as long as your serving is right. And there you can, I mean, it's almost unquestionable that Paul is this powerful uh, way maker. I mean, in the absence of the actual person of Christ, Paul is, I mean, he's still leading, he's still instructing, and he says down through here, in fact, he, uh, he instructs Timothy here to continue and to be faithful, and he uses his own life as a testimony, and who would raise their hand and say, well, I know this about Paul, and make any kind of negative uh, commentary. I mean, he's not a perfect man because he's a man. We're flawed, you understand? We're not going to get no better than what Jesus can make us here. And he's made him certainly an outstanding, uh, faithful uh, son. And when he addresses Timothy, uh, he, he mentions that. He reminds that. Uh, he wants him to be, and even calls him that, a faithful son in the, the faith. Uh, he is... He's, he's occupying, he's doing what he's supposed to do. I've seen young men, and I, I mean, I've been acquainted with them, I've been with them, I may have even joined them in some of their efforts, uh, trying, looking for something to do and feeling like whatever we got involved in just wasn't important enough to us. You know, we got this idea of trying to be top dog, trying to run out front, Tell you, the one running out front, he gets it first. You know that? I mean, you need to really think about what you're asking for. Uh, if the faithfulness has not been in your life, you're not going to get it anyway. Faithfulness is what counts with God. He can see your heart. He knows the truth about us. We can't slick him like we can others, you know. I mean, uh, some some places and some uh, places, uh, Folks that you get around, you can understand, they're just in it for one thing. They just want to make a name for themselves. That was not what Paul intended. And, he, and he's telling this, rehearsing this to this son in the faith who knows every bit of this is true. And now he leaves it. I'm glad he leaves this farewell letter that he writes to Timothy. And he leaves it for all of us to read his mail. And see what he said to one of, the, one of the sons in the faith. And then he doesn't just talk about the faithful son who uh, Timothy has become. But now he's going to put his own life on the line. And he says, secondly, that he had fought a good fight. Talking about his own self. He's not asking Timothy to do something that he had not already done himself. He had been a faithful son himself. He had been faithful in the ministry. He never let anybody down. I mean, he ran all the way to the finish line. He can see the finish line, and he doesn't mention anything in regret. He doesn't back up. He doesn't hesitate. He doesn't, he doesn't turn off to one side or the other or stop altogether. God, help us run all the way to the finish line. I think we have more uh, quitters than we do finishers, it seems like, sometimes anymore. A lot of difference between finishing and quitting. You hear me? A lot of difference. Paul's telling Timothy, uh, just get after it and stay after it. He said, I know it can be done. He said, I fought a good fight. He said, before he ever talked about his fight, he was saying to us in verse number six that he was ready to be offered. Time of my departure is at hand. I heard a story about the elderly lady is in the hospital. And 
She's on her last leg. They've already given up on her. Family has gathered in, and they've all filled the room, the hospital room. And like the granny that she was, the grandmotherly type that she was, and a child of God as well, she's encouraging the rest of the family. She's the one crossing, but yet she's the one encouraging. She's right at the point of death. And one of the children says to her mama, this is going to be it, it looks like. She said, well, they had come in just a brief time before and took some more blood. And she said, let's just wait and see what the blood has to say. Can I tell you, when I get to the end of this thing, I'm going to be real glad what the blood has to say. The blood of Christ has said every old vagrant sinner, every old vagabond, every old worthless piece of flesh can get all they need at Calvary. You don't need Jesus plus something, minus something. You just need Jesus. He is the supreme sacrifice for the supreme sinner's and any other kind of sinner, we all, are you listening? We've all been blighted by the devil and his trick. But here come Jesus with his grace again, just about the time I needed it. He showed up. Faithful son mentioned of Timothy. There's the good fighter, fought a good fight. He, in verse 7, He fought a good fight, he finished his course, and he kept the faith. I mean, he's just a little while from facing that one that he has served. But it's not unusual to have a face-to-face in Paul's life with the divine one himself. He was accompanied by him in all of those struggles, all of those times. Let me say thirdly, every time you mention faithfulness or you you mention somebody like Paul who fought the good fight, there's always a forsaker and Demas comes to mind. And I believe Paul and Timothy are heartbroken over the departure of Demas. Demas sounds a whole, whole lot like demon, devil. See, departing the faith links you up more with the evil one than it does with the Lord. The Lord never shied away. He never turned away from any hurdle, from any obstacle, from anything that came toward him. I'm glad we get a good Lord. The Bible said when he came into this earth and he fixed his face as it were a flint toward Jerusalem, he would not be detoured. He would not be stopped. He would not be in any way intimidated. Well, his disciples were even surprised. They had three and a half years with his teaching and preaching, and it's still some of the things that happened seem to catch them off guard. You know why? Because we're all limp a little bit in our brain. Some more than others. And don't raise your hand to brag about it, okay? He, uh, it's on the heart. As soon, as soon as Paul thought about the faithfulness of Timothy... And he also thought about the foul play and the foul delivery of Demas. It's gone now. I don't know about you, but I've had people in my life that, boy, oh boy, they almost made me not continue. I mean, I've had some I run with a good ways and I mean, I was ordained with a first cousin into the ministry. And he's so far gone now, he won't even speak to me on the phone. 
And I, I've done nothing to I never flaunted his choices, the wrong ones that he made. You know why? I make wrong ones. So do you. We're not to judge. But Paul's understanding that things are different. He's closing it out. He says, let me say, uh, Demas was the forsaker. But then as soon, about the same time, I think, in Paul's mind that he thought about a forsaker, he thought about a friend in Luke. And Luke is with him. And it's, uh, I mean, it's, uh, it's a hard thing to think about. But Paul was almost like Jesus in some ways that when he had to get out of town, sometimes he had to sneak out because they were after him, some in a vicious way, and some just wanting to follow him. And they couldn't all go with him. And Paul would, you know, they let him down one time, the side of a wall. That also tells you it couldn't have been too big a fella. I mean, you, can you see him letting me down the side of the wall in a basket? If they could have found the basket big enough, they'd have had a hard time getting a crowd big enough to hold the rope. But they let him down by the wall. He was fearless. He wanted to face them down. He wasn't afraid of them. But others around him were trying to protect him somewhat. Paul has reached a place where he, only Luke, he says, only Luke is with me. That's that close friend. Stays right with you. All the way to the end. He's in this prison house going to die in a little while. He's probably been able to see the chop block and maybe even activity in it, knowing he's coming up in a little while. Luke's with him. You say, well, how can you get encouragement from that friend? Because, I mean, it's pretty neat. Here's Paul in the jailhouse who they're going to execute in just a little while, and he's keenly aware of it, and he's telling us in the last letter that he writes to us, he, he is telling us in this letter that it's almost over. Time of my departure is at hand. And only, the word only has a negative connotation with it. Only Luke is, remember he used to have an entourage. Right. But now it's down to just Luke. But, cons I, I mean, uh, yeah, it's Luke, ain't it? Only Luke's with me. But consider who Luke is. It's Dr. Luke. Right? I mean, you think that it was accidental or coincidental that his personal physician is with him in jail? We know of Paul's illnesses and I speculate about them. He talked about, many people think it was eyesight. And his eyes were growing ever dim, maybe to the point of complete blindness was coming. He talked about one of the epistles. You see how large and hand I write. And many writers of the Bible seem to think the, the large hand was for his own personal benefit because Paul couldn't see any longer to make regular letters. His, his health is going down. And so the Lord just says, in that prison where they wouldn't give him water, they wouldn't, they wouldn't do anything to help Paul whatsoever. So the Lord said, Luke, you're just going to have to go over there and look after him. Help him. So he has his personal physician. And then he has probably the smartest, most intelligent intellect off the chart. He puts him in there with the Apostle Paul, who's the same way. Paul was trained at the feet of Gamaliel, one of the three uh, most uh, famous educators in his day. Yeah. You understand? I mean, they, they can talk on the same level. Yeah. I mean, if I was in there, I'd be talking about the ball game last night. And Paul wouldn't even know what that was. But he puts the fellow in there. It's running on the same line. No accident. 
on purpose. Deliberate. Now Paul is serious as he can possibly be that we're going to face God. And he mentions the two judgments at the quick of the quick, the living and the dead, the saved people and the lost people are going to stand before God. We're going to the judgment seat of Christ if we're saved, and the rest is all going to the great white throne. Everyone at the judgment seat goes to heaven. Everyone at the great white throne, except the spectators, are going to hell. You can try to sugarcoat it. You can try to smooth it out and make it better, but it's either or. Noah found grace in the eyes of God. If you don't find grace in the eyes of God, you're going to hell. It's not some religious involvement. It's not some church membership. It's not some phony baloney pope that'll get you in. Amen. Every once in a while, if I get anywhere close to the truth, you do, I don't even have to get plumb there. But if I get close, you don't have to make no racket. But every once in a while, do you good, just nod your head. <laughs> Amen. The faithful son is talk, talked about. The fighter is talked about speaking of himself. The forsaker Demas is mentioned. His friend Luke is mentioned. And then favorably, now, he mentions another character. The last one I'm going to mention. He said, take Luke, or take Mark. I don't know why I'm getting these words crossed up. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. Aren't you glad there's forgiveness? Uh, you make wrong choices and stumble and trip up, and the Lord will still take you in. He'll still forgive you and take you back. And Paul's demonstrating that here. This is the John Mark that went back on that first missionary journey and uh, left him and Barnabas to go along, finish up. And then they got ready to go on the second one, and Barnabas wanted to take with him. He wanted to take and go with John Mark, Paul said, no, can't do that. Can't do that. I'm going to have to go a different way. Now he said, he's profitable for me. The one that wouldn't have him. The one that wouldn't accept him. Have you ever felt unaccepted sometimes? You ever felt left out? That's kind of a bad feeling. And yet Paul said, bring him with you over here. And then he puts a... He, kind of puts a little jab in. He's wanting Timothy to do this fairly quickly because he thinks his time is short. He said, do thy diligence. His time is short. Come, come on over here. I ain't got much time left. Reckon how much time me and you've got left. Wonder, <clears throat> wonder what our far farewell letter is going to say. What are we writing in our life? Uh, a lot of times after someone passes and the family that's left behind goes to searching in, in the things that were left by the person, they find some things they didn't even know existed. And sometimes they find letters. And they read them letters and there'll be some things, boy, that really, really, really pick them up when they read them letters. What kind of letter are me and you leaving behind? My family's been in the ministry the whole time. I surrendered to preach about 45 days uh, after my second daughter was born. And we we just been in. My wife and I had a conversation. Uh, we talked about it before I ever made it official. And I told her, I said, I'm going to do this. She never objected. She's never objected in 46 years about the ministry itself. I've got a whole list of other things. But it hadn't had anything to do with the ministry. She's been in there the full way. In fact, sometimes she was pushing me. Huh? Paul's farewell letter. I'm glad he put it in the 
everlasting chronicle. So we could, you had a bad day lately? You're not looking at a chop block, are you? Huh? You're not threatened within an inch of your life. He's dying in just a little while. How is it for you? You had a good day? Thank God you have. Medical research, things that have happened. You know, I was told my wife's going to go have cataract surgery uh, in the next couple of months, first eye and then second eye. And it's amazing. I, I've told my family several times, when I was a little boy, almost all the old people couldn't see across the room. I, I'm talking about not too old, in the 60s. And there wasn't no such a thing as a cataract. They had Lincoln Continentals, but they... <laughs> But they didn't even have, they couldn't even help them. Most of the elderly died with real dim eyes. They couldn't hardly see to know who you were. And look how we've advanced. God has blessed us. And we throw his blessings away like they're cheap and they're not worth anything. And we talk about the expense and all that kind. You still live in the greatest country on earth. We've got all kinds of sin and all kinds of ill, but I'm glad we still reach the world with the gospel more than any other nation I know about. This young man and his wife, what a wonderful thing to do. Give their life to the ministry. In a foreign country, I think suffering for Jesus is when I can't find a holiday inn on the interstate, <laughs> trying to get in a bed somewhere to stretch out this frame. And they're going to a different culture and a different world. Pray for them and all the missionaries you know. Let's bow, bow for a word of prayer. Thank you for listening to me. Paul's farewell letter. What would yours say? They wrote one, stuck it in a desk somewhere, and they found it later on. Would you be bragging about the Lord? Or would you be majoring on some complaint that maybe you've had for some days? God help us to see the big picture, not just the little narrow stuff. Father, I pray tonight that you'll set the word of God in us in such a way as for you to get glory and us to get help, and we'll tell everybody that you did it. Amen. <clears throat> What's the last thing that you wrote on Facebook today? What's the last thing you wrote in your journal? What's the last thing you texted somebody? You say, well, preacher, it was just, it was, I was just mad at my wife, and I just sent her a, a little note. What if that were the last thing because you had a, a car wreck or motorcycle wreck or whatever, uh, you're going to have the last thing at some point. Uh, some of us from Val Verde, and I'm, I'm not saying this in a, in a you, you don't even have a problem. You ain't seen a problem. Everybody in this room is going to write your last note somewhere. Now, it may not be with a pen, but it is going to be with your life. And everybody here is going to be remembered. And I'm praying. I, I think about it now more than and. Obviously, there's reasons why, but uh, I want to finish uh, where when I do write it, it's worth reading. Amen? Amen. I certainly want to be uh, writing a good finish line. All right, Brother Bobby, you come, and uh, we're going to sing one more song. Then we're going to get the ladies up and uh, sing for us, and uh, I've enjoyed them this week. They'll be going, heading back early in the morning, get on the road. They're going to get back up to Tennessee. Uh, Brother Roger's going to have uh, his next appointment. It's Thursday morning, so they'll get home, get settled. And uh, they need to get on the road in the morning. But I've enjoyed them greatly. So as soon as we sing this last song, we'll have the Henson ladies come sing for us. Let's stand all together one more time. Turn to page 78 in the hymnal. When we all get to heaven, page number 78. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, He'll prepare for us a place. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. 
When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. And the last verse, onward to the prize before us. Soon his beauty will behold. Soon the pearly gates will open. We shall tread the streets of gold. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Amen. You may be seated. A beggar became a rightful heir. Ain't an everything this heart of mine, and he filled me with glory divine. Every moment he saved my soul. My name is recorded in the book of life in heaven. My sins are washed away, away by the Soul. I'll never get over that grace rich and free. The longer I live, the more it amazes me. I'll be just in a moment of time. All the joys of heaven then became mine. I'm in that very moment he saved my soul. New life became Just a broken sinner down the aisle made my way I'll, I'll not forget, forget it Oh, what a day Jesus saved me At that old altar where I bowed my knee Calvary 
sin stains are no longer. Oh, the blood, it was stronger. I know that Jesus saved me. Whenever we sing it, I have a hard time not just saying a little something about it. But you know, Mephibosheth, it's such a picture of such a wonderful treatment by a king to him. And he was a nothing, a nobody. Um, the king before was his grandfather, and Saul had been killed. And so Mephibosheth was left, and that was all that was left. And he did eat continually at the king's table, King David. But another part of that story is a little few more chapters down and it talks about where David had been away from his throne and um, Ziba the servant lied on Mephibosheth and told K King David that Mephibosheth had wanted his throne while he was gone. But that was a lie of, the, of Ziba who was you know, being an instrument of the devil I, I guess but just wasn't telling the truth and Mephibosheth's response was the most wonderful thing he said, take it all. He said, I'm going to take half of what I gave you and give it to Ziba. I'm going to take it back. And Mephibosheth said, take it all. He said, before you came along, these are my words, but before you came along, me and my house were a bunch of dead men. And that's the way we ought to feel. Do we serve the Lord for what he gives us and what he's, or for who he is and what he is? And I'm just thankful for that. And this song talks about that. Before the Lord came along, we were nothing. And, but Mephibosheth's testimony is in this song. And I hope it'll be a blessing to you. Just a young man crippled from a fall lived in Lodibar had nothing at all one day the king said I'm gonna make him my son and from that day on he lived as one Sometime later The king was told A lie But old Mephibosheth Tried to deny But the king in his anger Took much that he gave away but as for Mephibosheth, I heard him say, All that I am, all that I have came from you. Take what you want, do what you want. There's no virtue, there's no value in me. But years ago the king came by and he set me free. How the kings bless me in so many ways. Just like 
unbeschreibable I too can say All that I am All that I have Came from you Take what you want Do what you want sing this song that's out of this old old book song book here this was one of Micah's our son's favorite songs that he sang he sang it at his grandmother's funeral he sang it by himself and I guess it was like eight days before he went home to be with the Lord he sang this at his grandmother's funeral and he loved this song I love it too, and I hope it's a blessing to you like it has been to us. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus just to take him at his word just to Upon his promise just to know Thus saith the Lord Jesus, Jesus How I trust him Precious Jesus, Savior and my friend, and I know that Thou art with me, will be with me to the end. Jesus, Jesus. Jesus. 
you enjoyed that, say amen. amen. Looked at Brent, I said, you're not going to brag on me anymore tonight? You're not going to say anything else before I come and preach? And he said, no, I've said enough. Get up there. Get up there. Are we good to go? All right, excellent. I know what time it is, and I know how long you've been at church, so I will honor your time. Go ahead and say amen to that. But I do, I do um, believe that the Lord has one more thing for us. I'm going to... And I, and I trust that, that you'll listen because I really, I, I, I honestly wish I had like three more services with you. There's like a couple more. I've not preached on the family. I like to do that in revival. Um, I really have I've thought about preaching and, and debated. I actually tried to get your preacher to tell me which one to, to preach before we left, uh, what direction, and he was absolutely no help whatsoever. <laughs> I, uh, so, so I really, I, I believe this is where the Lord have us to be. So go ahead and turn to your Bibles to 2 Corinthians and, uh, and chapter 6. While you're turning, I want to say two things to you. First thing I want to say is, I don't want you to, to, to let it pass over what Miss Henson said. I think, I think you'll miss it if you didn't. She said, eight days before he died, he sang at his grandmother's funeral. Now, I don't know if you're doing arithmetic, but I want you to. That was her mom and her son with a little better, a day plus of a week. And she's up there singing about the Lord. I, do I need to say anything else? Uh, after what I preached last night, I think there goes a lady who trusts him. All right? I, I just, I, I'm listening, I'm thinking, she, is, that, is that what she just said? You know, mom, son, my hat heart, there goes a lady who loves the Lord. Amen. Second thing, preacher, thank you for having me. It's been my joy to be with you. Uh, the friendship that, that we have, uh, the camaraderie I enjoy. Miss Valerie, thank you for being so kind. You, uh, you have, I, I really want to preach on the, the role of a pastor tonight. I'm not, but you have some of God's choice servants right here. They are great, great people. Do not take for granted what God has blessed you with. I could say it and say it and say it. Do not take for granted. Um, your pastor, Brent, has vision. He has heart. He is a pastor's pastor. He has all the things that you desire. He's got some drive to him. You want a man with drive. And uh, it's just, uh, I, I'm just amen and amen. And Brother Henson, thank you. Thank you. If for nothing else, how long you, and there's plenty I could say, but for how long you stayed on the firing line. Now, my, I, I want to finish, not quit. When you say, I, I want to finish and not quit. And um, what a blessing it's been. I, I, I've come to try to be a challenge for you, but I'm going to go home blessed too. And uh, that's part of it. And, and I think um, revival sometimes is good for the pastor, the one doing the preaching, as it is for the people. And I hope that it's been a two-way street because I've thoroughly enjoyed spending time with you. All right, we really don't have time to visit, okay? So let's all stand and pay honor to God and His Word, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, and uh, let's jump right into to learning a lesson. I'm going to preach a message that is an unusually titled message and an unusual direction, but I'll prove the direction uh, and, and the need for it after I give you the title. The title is A Positive Look at separation. I want to end the revival in a positive note. And, and the reason why I said a positive look is it seems to me in, in our fundamental Bible-believing churches that we, we look upon the subject of separation in a negative way. And that is not at all how God gives it. And, uh, you know, I'm even going to backtrack and say in my early days of preaching, and I, you know, I've been at one church now for 29 years, your preacher told you that, but in my early days, I would preach on separation. I, I, I'd almost be ashamed for you to see me, like, bless God, with a snarl on my face. And I was preaching in such a way, if I was sitting in the pew, I'd say, I know he's right because it's in the Bible, but I don't like it. Yeah. Problem with that is that is not the way it's presented exactly. in yeah. Scripture. I'll show it to you, and I'll prove it to you. And we'll leave on a positive note. For you see, if you come to revival and you hear God's word preached and you go home saying, I know he's right, but I don't want to do it, then I've lost, and you've lost, and God's not been honored. 
But if you go home saying, I love him. I love him so much I want to be close to him. And I realize that biblical separation is a pathway to closeness. Oh my, we all win, don't we? And that really is what I want to do for just a few moments, okay? I'll honor your time, but I want to change the way you think about biblical separation. I want to take the snarl off your face a little bit about, I know it's right and I ought to hear it, but I don't want to hear it. I want you to leave going, oh yeah, yeah, this is the direction I want my life to be, okay? The Bible says in verse 11 of chapter 6, Oh, you Corinthians, our mouth is open unto you and our heart is enlarged. Doesn't sound like to me Paul's coming across kind of ugly. Sounds like to me he's coming across a little compassionate. Man, I, let me transliterate that for you. I just love you. You Corinthians. Now, if there's ever a church that'd be hard to say I love you, it'd probably be the church at Corinth. I think most of us would acknowledge it was probably the most difficult church that Paul had to pastor. But look at what he's saying right here. Our mouth is open, our heart is enlarged. You're not straightening us, but you're straightening your own bowels. Now for recompense in the same, I speak as unto you, my children, be also enlarged. Really pretty King James, and here's what we're saying. I love you like a child and I want you to grow. That's what he's saying. So, so I want to just off the bat, can we see that, that Paul's not coming across with a bless God mindset that I've been guilty of preaching this passage with? Can you see the attitude of the great apostle Paul that Brother Henson was describing to us? And indeed, everything he said in some is Paul. But can you see, it's not at all in a condescending, I'm the man and you listen to me. Not at all. I love you like a child. I want you to grow up right. I want there to be a heart that changes because of this truth. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers? For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord? That word concord means agreement. Hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them and I'll be their God and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you. I'll be a father unto you. There you go again. You shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. I want to read verse 1 of chapter 7 because I really believe it doesn't end there. Having therefore... These promises, what promises? The ones he just got through giving to you. That's why I don't want to stop there. Having therefore these promises, what I just got through saying, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh, the spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Father, thank you so much for the opportunity that's been mine to preach your word here. Thank you for this good church, these people. I've already grown to love them. I truly do believe that your hand is on this church and on this ministry. And I pray right now that I can be a blessing for just a few moments. In the name of Jesus, we ask it. And amen. You may be seated. Our church is one, and, and your pastor has been in my pulpit, so he knows. Our church is one that, that really is easy to preach to. If you preach, and, and I remember, it's been a while now, but, but I remember going through the book of Genesis. I spent about two, two years preaching through the book of Genesis. I'm actually two years right now in Romans. I'll be in Romans chapter 14 this coming Sunday. But if you preach through the book, you're going to cover some things. I remember when I got to the ark of God, and truly the ark of God in the book of Genesis is really a great picture of salvation. You know that. We, we know that the door was open for anyone and everyone to come into the ark and be saved. We know they did not, but the door was open. And when I talked about the graciousness of God and that he really wanted people on that ark because he loved people, man, you talk about the the Come in and be saved. Our people, amen, that. Matter of fact, I told you I've already in Romans and, and we already covered chapter 10 where the Bible gives us that plan of, of confess and believe and we can be saved. Our folks, amen, that. I was preaching through the book of Revelation been years ago. I think the, the three books every preacher ought to preach through is, is Genesis, how it all started, Revelation, how it's all ending, and Romans, God's theology book. Those are the three great books to preach through. I was preaching through Revelation. It's been years now. 
And you know, you're not going to preach the revelation. You're going to see a picture from, from above, from heaven, and you're going to see a picture from below on earth. And truthfully, you can't interpret revelation without understanding that you have different pictures and you've got to see where the sight's coming from. You know, we get to that part about glorification, come up and be saved, come up and you'll see him. You know, it's kind of hard not to get excited about the day that he calls us home. I preached on the call to salvation, everybody will amen me, you amen me. I preached about the call to glorification, everyone will amen me, you amen me. But in between the call of salvation and glorification, there's the call to separation. And it's really hard to get an amen. And I'm going to lay, I'm gonna, I really am going to lay it the blame where I think a lot of it should lie. A lot of the blame lies in us, the ministers of God's gospel that has not, have not presented separation correctly. I've told you I didn't in my early days. Well, you see, there's nothing ugly. There's nothing mean about saying you were on the road to hell. God saved you from your sins and you repented of your sins and you turned and you looked unto your God. He changed your life and said, I don't want you going that direction anymore. I look at it and I really believe that there's really a misunderstood doctrine with separation. For you see, I don't believe separation means isolation. A matter of fact, I believe if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5, when, when, when you see Paul, he uses the phrase, yet not altogether with fornicators of this world. Literally, I'm not going to, to separate myself in the sense that I'm not willing to speak or be around people that are unsaved. Truth is, I want everybody in my community to see me as a friendly individual. It doesn't mean isolation to the point that I don't speak or have anything to do with because I can't win an unsaved person if I will not speak to them. So separation's not isolation. I'll tell you something else. Separation taken to the extreme really is the stuff that monasteries are made of. I heard one man make the statement, you know that living in a hole will not make you holy? Isn't that true? And I think sometimes that's their mindset that, that, that well, I want to be holy, so mm, don't talk to me. I'm, that's ridiculous. I'm against legalism. Now, no, I know we're a fundamental Bible-believing church right here. I know that. But hold, hold it now. You're against legalism too. That's adding works for salvation. Not some of the high standards. That's not what legalism is. Legalism is saying you have to do anything besides place your faith and trust in Christ to be saved. Are you against legalism? I'm against legalism. Do you know sometimes there have been some people that have taken the doctrine of separation and they've made legalism out of it. And so I, I look at the fact that I don't believe in isolation making me holy. I, I really don't think living in a monastery is the way God would have me to go. And I certainly do not want to add works to salvation. And I'm thinking there are people that when they hear the word separation, that's exactly what they think. We've got to change that. We've got to look at the text and understand that. I wrote this. This is just from Jeff Jones, me just, just thinking about this. And I, I tell you, I write sentences and put them on my computer when I'm working on a sermon so that I'll stay focused on, on the theme. Here's what I wrote. Biblical separation should be a truth in my life, not that makes me feel miserable or cramped or restricted, but an avenue toward closeness between God and I. Now, I'm just thinking that you're not going to read a book on that, all right? That's just me thinking. But I want to read it again. I want you to get it. Biblical separation should be a truth in my life, not that makes me feel miserable, cramped, or restricted. God's not putting you in a box. Not that makes me feel miserable, cramped, or restricted, but an avenue toward closeness between God and I. I don't think that's negative at all. Matter of fact, if you want to be honest with you, I think it's wonderful. 
but I can say no to things that will ruin my life so that I can walk with a God that loved me enough to die for me can never be ugly. It has to be positive. Let's look at the text. Just, you'll see three things quickly. First, I do want you to see God's position here. God's position is clearly stated in verse 14. You've read it already with me. But verse 14 plainly tells us, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Now, what that is, most people don't realize, but you know, Paul was really a master. It's amazing the two sermons are going to go together more than you realize, Brother Henson. Paul was a highly educated man and a master of the Old Testament law. And do you know that a lot of Paul's sermons that you'll see in a lot of his writings are nothing more than quotations of the Old Testament? Did you know this particular passage, Be you not uniquely yoked together with an unbeliever, is nothing more than a quote from the book of Deuteronomy. Matter of fact, let me give you the quote. It's a quote in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 22 and verse 10, where God literally says, Thou shalt not plow with an ox and an ass together. There's a pretty good picture. Doesn't that look ridiculous? I mean, doesn't it look kind of crazy? Now, now, why would you not take a donkey and an ox and tie them together and try to plow a field? And the reason why is because they do not work together. And the reason they do not work together is because they have two separate natures. You say, where do you get that from, preacher? Well, let's look at it. What fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? None. What fellowship hath light with darkness? None. What concord, what agreement is Jesus making with Belial, the devil? None. And I can go on, but I'd insult your intelligence. Literally, what he's saying is, that doesn't work because one animal has one nature and the other animal has another nature. And just in that very same way, you've got saved. Christ abides inside of you. And now you're going to go and yoke up with an unsaved individual that Christ is not inside of? The two cannot work together because the two do not agree. Now in writing sermons, I want to prove to you it's not all that difficult because I wrote down three things that just make sense to me. And here it is. Number one, that principle makes sense. I mean, I know I'm a homiletics professor. You're going, well, I could have written that. Ding, ding, ding. Does it not make sense? That principle makes sense to me. Number two, that principle is desirable. That I not yoke up with an unbeliever or that I not not yoke an ox up with a, with a donkey. I'll give you a great example of this. Perfect example. I, um, I'm in my fourth home and uh, in the thriving metropolis of Fuquay Verena. We're in the south side of Raleigh. And our, our house market is pretty good there. So I have bought and sold through the years and you know, stay at one church, get a little equity in one home, sell it and go, move up. And, and um, as it stands right now, I have a, a nice home. And, and, and um, believe it or not, I'm going to build one more. That, that, uh, that, and I've already bought the land that, that, that I'll build the home on. But moving from my first house to my second house was interesting. In my first house, the neighborhood was just a small neighborhood and yards did not matter. And I was not a yard man, cared very little about it. It was just weeds to knock down and thus I would mow my weeds. We moved into a nicer neighborhood, the second house. And we moved the side of an individual who had a job as a landscaper. It is never good to move in the side of a landscaper. My wife is here tonight and she will not like this aspect of it, but it's a fact nonetheless. We would pull into our drive and she would go, look at Matt Marine's yard. Is that not pretty? Oh, look at the grass. Oh, look at the shrubbery. Look, look, look. Because I had never been a yard man. I had never worried much about it. I had weeds. I liked my weeds just fine. I cannot get into the story, but we actually, we actually won. Matt and Matt Marine started to come into our church. Kids are actually for years were enrolled in our school, so that's a long story. He was unsaved, and man, it, just a long story. I can't even get it. Don't have time to get into it. But here's what happened. After we became friends, I finally said, Matt, you've got to hook a brother up. I need a yard like yours. I need, it needs to look better. And he said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Here's what we're going to do. You've got to take everything out. That's garbage. That's true. That's what he said. Is that not true? 
kill your grass, take all the shrubby garbage. All right? We go to, and he's, you know, he does it for a living, so he's, he knows the trees. I couldn't tell you the name of, of shrubs or anything like that. My wife can. And, and we come back, he has this trailer. We come back with all our shrubbery, all of our things. There's a pretty bay window on this house years ago. And, and, and we planted a tree that had a little heart-shaped leaves on it and, and little bushes that go around it that turn red at a certain time of year. And, and, and we put, this is really, this, I still laugh about this. We put a seat, a concrete seat, and a bird bath in front of the bay window. Now you want to talk about not absolutely having a brain in your head? If you sit on that concrete seat, do you really think a bird's going to come take a bath? <laughs> think about that a moment. That was, but it looked pretty, or as we say, purdy. That's P-U-R-D-Y. Well, I had it all looking good. I put the pine bark mulch in there and had that area. I guess, I don't know, two, maybe three weeks, maybe a month. I don't know. Chapel day at our Christian school, and I'm going to preach chapel. I remember exactly what I'm wearing. I'm wearing khaki pants and a, and a dark blue sport coat, yellow tie, and blue shirt. Don't ask me why it stands up in my mind to this day. We're talking years ago. It stands out in my mind. I go bebopping, and, I, and I, I must confess, I couldn't walk by that and not look at, that looks so good. That looks pretty. I, I just couldn't do it. I, I, every time I walked by, I'd stop, and I'd look and go, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, I did that. Yeah, yeah, that's nice. All right, but one day, I looked. You ain't going to believe this. The weeds were coming up. Now, I have to turn in my man card, Brent, for this, but I got down, and guess what I did? I pulled those weeds. I know. I'm sorry, guys. I, you know why? The weeds were undesirable. I just explained to you biblical separation. God cleans you up. God makes you a new creation. You know what biblical separation is? It's pulling those weeds. So I, I looked at it and said, it makes sense. It's desirable. Third thing, it's practical. Everyone in this auditorium knows it's easier to pull somebody down than it is to pull someone up. Everyone knows it. Everyone understands that concept. And that's all God is saying right here. And so I look at this and I say, what are some ways that we are unequally yoked? And here it is. Our young people are going to love me for this. But here we go in a nutshell. Do not date. Do not date. An unsaved individual. Now here's why I say that. You know who you're going to marry? Someone that you date, unless you're from India. Now I have been to India and I've preached oodles of times with him at Patel there in India and they have arranged marriages there and uh, I know look, Money Thomas is the assistant pastor and the guy actually going to take over that church and he did, never even knew his wife until Dr. Thomas said, Money here she is. Here's your wife. Y'all go get married. Here, y'all. You, you, you take him. You take her. Yep. Bye. I, I did not make that up. That is true. But unless you're from India, that's not true for us. Somebody say amen. <laughs> but I know. Well, I got him to come to church, preacher. I've heard that. I've been at one church so long. I've heard that more than I can count. And I, I have a standard answer when young people come and say to me, they're dating him and they're getting them to come to church like I'm supposed to get excited. Here's my answer. Dating is not a mode of evangelism. I'm glad they're in church, but dating is not a mode of evangelism. But, but while you're amen to me, I think you ought to be careful who your business partner is. Uh-oh, did I say that? I can take you to a lady right now that is still, I said still, paying the price because she went into business with an unsaved individual. She came and talked to me before she did it, trying to get my rubber stamp. She had already decided to do it before she ever talked to me. I told her then it was a mistake, and, I, and she knows I use this when I go and preach. She said, tell everybody, there is a difference. There is a difference in somebody who's an honest person with character and somebody who's unsaved. Now she makes payments on a business that's defunct and he did the paperwork to where she's making the payments. He walked away scot-free. But you know, why should she be surprised? He's unsaved. 
Can I say to you, and I need to hear this sometimes, even close friendships. I'll help this church if you'll listen to me. Stealing this from Dr. Dobson, credit where credit's due. I'm listening to him, and he said there's three modes of friendship that you need to understand. There's the first circle of friends, and everybody should be in that, in that circle. Saved or lost? I want everyone to perceive me as friendly so that I can talk to them about Jesus. Right? You move to the second. This, these are people you'll go out with and, and you'll develop a relationship with and, and friendships with, and they begin to affect you, and you begin to affect them. There's a third category. Those are your closest. Those are what we would call your inner friends. Dr. Dobson says, truly, if you have five real, real true inner circle friends, you actually are blessed. He said, look at this group right here. That's who you are. That's who you are. Watch me. Unsaved, everybody I meet I want here. As we develop relationships, people move from there to here. Brother Brent and I are definitely here now. I have a trust in him. Matter of fact, I would dare say, we'll, we, I, I could foresee us moving just the way we view ministry. I need to be picky about who's here. I can't imagine an unsafe person being in this circle with me. No telling what I'd be. My wife, who and I picked on her a while ago, but she really is a jewel of a wife and very good, very good for me. Back in, in before my accident, um, I used to used to hit the gym really hard. And you go at five five thirty in the morning. That's what time I, I'm an early riser. You, you, there's not many people there except in January. For the first two weeks in January, then it just fizzles right back out again. <laughs> that is true as true could be. But I would go, and there's a guy, his name was Gene, and, and, um, and, and no one's there, and I would spot for him, and he would spot for me, and it didn't take very long before we developed a, a friendship, and boy, he thought it was really neat that I was a preacher. He came to hear me preach probably, I'd say, eight to ten times altogether. He, he loved it, but he didn't want the Lord. I witnessed to him, I talked to him, he never, he never got saved. He didn't want to get saved, but he loved having me as a friend. Can I tell you I enjoyed having him as a friend as well? A successful businessman had a neat boat, had a boat to go over 70 miles an hour. That's cool to drive a boat going over 70 miles an hour. It messed up my hair. <laughs> my wife said to me one day, she said, Jeff, I, I want to remind you he's, he's not saved. And I'm like, honey, he, he, drink, he would drink, but he would never drink around me. I said, you can't. I said, I can't go to a restaurant with you, and you, you have a, a beer there. I just can't do it. But who I am matters. And stuff like that. So I, I was like defending. No, no, it's not. You. But he's not coming to church anymore. He's not. My ability to win him, obviously, and of course, the Lord does to save him, but, but he basically, in his mind, crossed the line. No, the answer is no. And that does happen sometimes. But he wanted to be close to me. He liked me. And I liked him. But my wife was right. He definitely was in this category with me and was headed here and blatantly told me, I do not want to be saved. I'll think about it. Now, let me tell you what I didn't do. I didn't walk, Rich, you're, you're, you're Gene for just a moment. I didn't walk and say, unclean, I can never talk to you again. <laughs> Leave me alone. Get behind me, Satan. I never did that. I started backing away, just backing away. I, I think to this day, he would take, of course, he, he lives in a different area now. He would tell you, just my friend, but he knew I made a willful, because I had lost the influence to see him get saved. I wanted him to get saved. But now he's beginning to affect me. Now look, I'm a preacher of the gospel. If it could happen to me, it could happen to you. But you cannot, you cannot. Be close to people that do not trust in your Christ. The ox doesn't need to be yoked up with the donkey. That's not to, to, to put us on a... It's a fact that natures don't agree. They don't work together. I submit to you, I see God's position. I understand it, don't you? Look quickly. God's promises. This is so sweet. Go to verse 17 and 18. This is just, to me, it just gets precious. Wherefore, come out from among them and be separate, 
saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. We're going to come back to that. And I'll be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. If you look up the word receive, some of you probably have the, the capabilities of doing that. I see a lot of iPads out around. If you look up, I believe it's Vine's word study, literally says it means to receive with favor. Now hold it. What does that mean? I'll explain it for you. You'll all understand it. I am... I have done this for years and years. Uh, ever, since, ever since I worked for the Ken Lane Painting, I was 18 when I got the job in college and I worked my way through college there. Ken Lane would always say to me, don't ever go anywhere without a $100 bill. So no matter where you go, always make sure you have $100. Now why? He said, because cash works when nothing else works. Now, you're probably not going to get that $100 bill from me. You might come to me afterwards and say, Brother Jeff, I really need it. And I guess if it was really, really desperate, I might pray about it. But you're probably not going to get that. But there are. There are a couple of girls that could. One's name is Stacy. Stacy's 26 years old. And she's married now, but you know, there's something about her that has my heart string. She's mine. The other's Leslie. Of course, she gives a whole lot more than $100. I'm still paying for her college bill right now. But you know, she came to me and said, Daddy, I really, really need the money. She'd probably get it. Oh, why am I telling you that? Go back to the verse. Wherefore, come out from among you and be you separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. I'll receive you with favor. I'll be a father unto you. You shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. You want him to treat you like you on earth would treat your child? Blessings, you'd, you'd rather die than them go without. How many of you are like me? You just, that's just in you. You love them. That, you love people, but there's something different about your own. Can we agree with that? Well, I... I don't know if you understand what this text is saying, but the text is literally saying if you'll separate yourself away from wickedness and you'll consecrate yourself to your God, you can have a special relationship with Him. That's not bad, you know? That's not even mean. I, I kind of think that's special. I, I, I think that's not negative, but I think it's positive. There's just something about that, that that resonates with me. How about you? We're going to skip over for the sake of time and go to the last one. Thirdly, I want you to see the process. The process. I'm Bless his heart back there. Him keeping up with how much I just cut out for the sake of time, you know. He's like, man, he's good. That's okay. You'll be, you're, you've got the gist. We're okay. The process. Up to this point, will, he, will we agree that everything I've said has been positive, not negative? Viewed in a good light, not a negative light. Can we agree with that? Say amen. amen. All right. This is going to be the only negative thing I say. And I don't necessarily believe it's negative, but I know it can be perceived negative. The passage says, having therefore these promises, promises I just made reference to, what I've just taught you. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness. Now, of our flesh and our spirit. That's twofold now. I am, I know cleansing myself of my flesh and my attitude can sometimes be difficult. How many recognize? Because the flesh pulls pretty hard. And I, I, I'm, not, I'm not ignorant of theology. When we talk about cleansing, I understand the position I have in Christ, okay? I was, whenever I got saved, he forgave me of my sins, past, present, and future. Somebody say amen to that. So I know my position in Christ. I, I understand the position. I even understand the practical cleansing, that as a saved man, God desires me not to allow trash in my life. But on a practical eyeball to eyeball level, can we agree sometimes that we allow our flesh to have probably more rain than we want to admit? And can we agree that sometimes our attitude kind of smells? 
You know, I think I said it Sunday. We don't smoke, we don't chew, we don't run with those who do, but our attitude can stink. We can be judgmental. We can be holier than thou. We can have the attitude that we're better than someone else. Or we can have the attitude, I don't like the preacher when he does that. I don't agree that they, well, you know, good night. How many things in life do you agree with with that attitude? The Bible says, let's be honest. We see the promise. We see what God would do for us. Let's cleanse ourselves of sins of our flesh. Let's cleanse ourselves of sins with our spirit. Make sure those things are in line. Then he uses a phrase that's almost hard to understand. Perfecting holiness. A lot of times when you see the word perfecting in the New Testament, get out of your mind a perfect man. Get in your mind a maturing man because that actually would be a good synonym for it. Perfecting holiness. And, and, and let me tell you what Wearsby says about that. I love wearing Wearsby on this more than anything else. He said, work on it. That's what it means. Just work on it. Don't be satisfied where you are. Be willing to work on it. Can we end our revival this way? Everyone in this auditorium knows the sins of their flesh. They know the sins they need to get rid of. Everyone in this auditorium knows if they have an attitude issue that needs to be dealt with. God is saying, I want you not to be satisfied where you are, but be willing to work on it. And if you're willing to work on it, you can have the special relationship that God promises right here in this text. So here's my revival plea and this is my ending statement if you're willing to work on it this invitation is for you if you're willing to say I'm not satisfied I am willing to check out the sins of my flesh to check out the attitude I sometimes can have I'm not satisfied where I am I want to be closer to my God and I'll, I'll make this statement right now you're as close to God as you've chosen to be you're as close to him as you've chosen to be. I want you to stand with your heads bowed and your eyes closed for just a moment. Stand with your heads bowed and your eyes closed just a moment. You say to me, preacher, there's some things that, that I must admit I ought to work on. I've, I've listened to what you had to say. I see the text. I, I see the promise that I can have in God if I work on it. I recognize there are some sins in my flesh and there are some sins in my spirit that they need to be corrected. That's me, preacher. That's me. If you're willing to work on it, if you're seriously willing to work on it, the altar's open to you. I'm going to pray and we'll have music and we'll sing a song, but the plea is don't come unless you're really willing to work on it. Father, thank you for the opportunity to preach in this pulpit one more time. Thank you for this pastor and for this church. God, do it for us tonight. Give us that special moving where, where we can have that close relationship with you. Help us to be willing, willing to work on it. In the name of Jesus, we present this and beg it. And amen. If God has spoken to your heart, I'm going to turn the service over to your pastor. But if God has spoken to your heart and you're willing to work on it, I certainly desire for you to do it even now, even tonight, as God speaks, as we sing, brother. work on it I'm willing to work on it pray find in me thine all in all Jesus paid it all all to him I owe sin had left a crimson stain he washed it white as snow. Lord, now indeed I find Thy power and Thine alone Can change the leper spots And melt the heart of stone. Jesus paid it all 
All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. For nothing Need could have place whereby thy grace you'll find to claim, that you receive I will wash a lot more from my God than you'll ever give in the blood of Calvary's Lamb Jesus paid it all all to him I owe sin had left a crimson stain he washed it white as snow. Your eyes are closed. Folks are still praying. Jeff told me, he said, I'm going to just, I'll buy you just a moment, play softly, Antonell. He told me, he said, I'm going to preach on separation. And, uh, you know, I, I look at our church and, and I know where we are. It's a pastor's job. If I could ever get you to see what he gave tonight, the positive side of it. It would help you. He said, preacher, to help the church. It would, but it would help you so much to understand. The only one that limits God in your life is you. He can't be that father to you until you come out so that you are more important than friendship, association, relationships. Separation isn't about I look good, you look good, look how we're doing. It's about, God, I want you to bless me. I want favor with you. I want friendship with you. I wish I'd have heard that message in the 70s. Amen. Father, I pray tonight you'd help us. Lord, if we would love you like we should, it would help us to live for you like we should. If we live like you, live like we should, we certainly could experience, Lord, just a greater intimacy, a greater blessing. But Lord, so much. It's the old song, nothing between me and the Savior. Lord, there's, there's a new modern version of that. It probably should say so many things between me and the Savior. Lord, I pray that we would just meditate. That's a good meditating sermon. Go home and chew on that for a little while. Think about that for a little while. What is it that is in the way of your treating me like that favored son, that favored daughter? Lord, I pray you bless tonight as we go our separate ways. Pray for those that travel. Pray for Brother Jeff and Miss Rose as they head back to Raleigh. Henson's as they head back to East Tennessee. Lord, as we come back to church tomorrow night, either here in our, in our uh, normal place of worship, God, that we would be excited. And Lord, we'd be anxious to just go forward the week to come. I know our church is excited as we get ready for the Philippine trip for some. But then, Lord, just the work of the ministry here that will happen this week and next. Bless, I pray, may we never, never get over all that you've done for us. Lord, as Brother Roger said, may we certainly finish and not quit. We pray it now in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I'm asking our ushers to come. Uh, we're going to receive the offering tonight. And uh, if you can give to help in the meeting, that'd be a blessing. But uh, we're going to receive our offering. And then I want to say, I haven't said a word really about the, the table, but uh, go back by the Henson's table they've got uh, their music and you may receive the offering gentlemen go right ahead everything you give go help us tonight in the meeting brother paul I need to see you for just one second immediately after the service if you would but uh, go back by that uh, go back by the table and uh, pick up their stuff uh, i listen to the henson's music uh, at least once or twice a month as far as just go through the songs and i've heard them and when you said, I'm going to sing this, Grant, now that's how much we've heard them over the years. Grant's like, oh, I like that one, I like that one. And uh, there's songs, there's so many songs. Valerie and I have a playlist that they never do. And every now and then we'll say, y'all do this one. And they say, well, it's, it's been so long since we've sang that, uh, we may have forgot the words to it. And that's Renee right there, she forgets the words. But anyway, uh, there's so many great songs. Micah wrote over 175 songs. Many of them recorded over the years. So I uh, also want you to go by and uh, spend some time with Brother Jeff. And uh, boy, I want you to meet our missionary tonight. What a blessing uh, to have these guys here. You pray for Brother Chris and his wife. Uh, his father-in-law, uh, Brother Paris, is in Israel and appreciate him so very much. Uh, his mother-in-law, we don't appreciate that much, but his father-in-law, we do. Just kidding. And uh, we're going to be dismissed. Brother Jonathan, glad to have you. Good group down.
and the Keith, we love you. And my wife needs to see you about a, a, a piece of jewelry she got to get fixed. So y'all want to talk about that? But let's all stand together, and uh, we'll be dismissed. Any announcements, Julie? Any announcements, Brother Tyler? Teens will be in here tomorrow night. Bus stop will be here tomorrow night. Master Club will be here tomorrow night. Senior church family will be here tomorrow night. God bless you. I love you. Come by and see Brother Jeff. Come by and see the Hensons. You are dismissed, and I'll get you some help. <laughs>